Thanks for joining us here at Rose Quartz Mediumship Podcast, where today we have the pleasure of chatting with Ron, who is part of the Rose Quartz Mediumship community and is here to share a little bit about his story from childhood trauma through addiction and into inner peace and spirituality. Yes. So thank you so much for being here with us and My for pleasure. being willing to share your story so vulnerably with us. I know that there are components of your life that are going to really resonate for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think that your story is a really powerful one. So thank you for sharing it. Yes. So tell us a little bit about how you came into the Rose Quartz Mediumship community and then we'll get into some of childhood stuff. Okay. So it started with my wife looking for a solution to an issue that she was not even aware that she had. She wasn't really sure what it was. She just knew she was seeking something other than what was available to her. Yeah. Things weren't really panning out. Um, Western medicine wasn't for her. Um, the religious beliefs that we had really weren't resonating for her. So she was turned on to spirituality, which led her down a path to you. And from there, um, I was watching the change and the shift in her. And she asked me if I'd like to learn more about this, which brought me to you. And we've both been on a journey ever since. So. Yeah. Oh, it's so fun when you see couples who make the choice to take a deep dive into spirituality together. It's definitely um, difficult at first to be vulnerable with each other in ways that you haven't, especially when you've been together for a long time. But once you realize that it's just human interaction, it's very simple to do. You find it very, very comforting, actually. Yeah, isn't that funny how we have this established pattern of the way that we engage with our spouse? Yeah. And when you step into spirituality, it really shakes that up. It does. You feel way more comfortable because mm -hmm. your vulnerabilities are something you don't want to share with people. Or you yeah. don't want people to think that you're weak because of that. If it's not being weak, it's not harboring things that are bothering you and finding a way to release them and move to the next chapter in your life comfortably without yes. carrying a lot of trauma. Yeah. 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 It's so beautiful. I love that you guys are on this journey together. Yeah, fun, actually. It's, it's a lot funner than I thought it was going to be. At first, it was going to be <laughs> scary and dark. And uh, at first, you know, you think that. You should tell you some stories. As soon as you start to feel changes and releases and realize what you can find out of it, it becomes fun. It becomes yeah. something that you look forward to. And there's no doubt that people look forward to any spirituality in their life that yeah. they haven't experienced. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that you observed your wife going through a pretty significant shift. And then she kind of asked you if you wanted to, to know more and be uh, incorporated into that world. <clears throat> what was the biggest shift that you saw in her? Um, her being able to acknowledge the situation she was dealing with as something that she can't just control herself mm. not that she can't control herself but she needs help with to get to those places people need to ask the questions we want to ask ourselves and yeah. she definitely it shook her up a little bit at the beginning but i could <laughs> see the the change dramatically quick and i wanted some of it there's no doubt about it you have some jealousy to people actually healing and when you see that, you think, well, I want some of that. When someone's doing something that's fun and great, we all have that first reaction to it. Um, and then you have, well, what does it involve? Where are you going to do? What am I going to have to do? Uh, but her change was, was still going, not, not perfect. Uh, we all have our ups and downs. We still find new trauma. Uh, but her finding her traumas and releasing them was the greatest part for me. Mm. Yeah. That must have been so beautiful to watch your wife, who you love so much, yeah. go through these transformations. It was difficult at first. Um, then I realized the changes that were starting to happen. Because my first reaction to anything is trying to solve it or make people feel better. 
but I know I can't do that for everybody. Mm-hmm. And that was the hardest part for me. But as it started to unfold and she started to get relief and the changes started to happen, it was definitely um, pleasurable for me to see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, I wanted some of it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I love that piece that you spoke about there with the jealousy, right? Like when you watch somebody healing, yeah. when you watch somebody finding inner peace, when you watch somebody finding a space of balance in their life that they haven't had before, you do want some of it. Everyone does. Yeah. It's undeniable. There's always something that somebody has envy or jealousy over. Um, just admitting it to yourself or admitting it and doing something about it is yeah. really going to get a result. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Doing nothing is going to have the same thing. So yeah, no, right. I'm happy to go down this road. <laughs> uh, didn't know a lot about spirituality uh, in the way that I thought I knew spirituality. Being mm. brought up Catholic religion, totally different uh, perspective on being, I'd call brainwashed into a somatic, you know, just a system that they want you to follow. It's not always the right system for everybody. And right. if you find no relief in it, uh, why continue it? Yeah. So. If it's the right path for you and it feels good and it feels authentic, awesome. But if it doesn't, just know that there's lots of other pathways out there, and right? There's a road for everybody. That's right. And if you don't try it, you don't know where it goes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about your childhood and and maybe some of the trauma that you experienced and where that led you as an adult um, trying to process that trauma. So I guess to sum it all up is I grew up uh, without a father from the age of five. Uh, he passed away at an early age from complications due to um, an illness he had. And my mother did the best to raise four children. I was the problematic child, I'd say. Um, I was the one that was the most mischievous. Um, so, of course, growing up without a father, you have a lot of freedom, a lot more than most children do. So you have not two authority figures in your life and I was able to get away with a lot more than most people would which led me to my teenage years which I ended up in a youth development center and I spent uh, several years there in and out which is jail for children Uh, you are locked up and that was a lot of trauma on me Uh, it was a choice that my mother had to make to put me there because it was the alternative to her dealing with the way that I was so that created trauma for me that I didn't even realize I had until recently. Uh, from there, I went into, of course, out of teenage years into adulthood and oh, found myself troubled, not even knowing what it was, uh, mm-hmm. what kind of traumas I was carrying. We avoid them and we move on with our life. We go, we go. Um, in my mid 20s, I started drinking. Um, married at 28 the drinking got more severe for me as the years went on by the time I was 36 I was full blown alcoholic and abusing prescription drugs so that was that was quite an event for me that almost killed me that brought me to a point where it was very difficult for my wife to watch Um, she was trying to save me she never gave up Um, I found sobriety at about 40 to 42, I was completely sober, and I've been sober since. Congratulations. It was a tough run. It was was a tough run. Some people do it early in life. I did it a little late in life, so it was tough on my body, but I am healthy now um, with all the support of my wife. She was the one who brought me through all of it. Um, And then, of course, learning about spirituality and bringing me here and getting involved with Rose Quartz and being able to release trauma in my life is those years we just talked about brought a lot of trauma to me. How could they not? They brought a lot of trauma that we swallow down and we don't look at. And I've been able to release a portion of it, not all of it. I'm still finding different doors to open and walk down and say, geez, I forgot about that. Or I've never looked at that. And uh, I've done a lot in the last two years, but I still got more to do. But I feel a lot better being able to explore all those traumas and release it. 
Isn't it amazing how when we are willing to talk about our trauma and when we're willing to be with it and we're willing to explore it, it takes the power away from it? It does. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling that you tell yourself stories about them and that they're okay and that this is just the way life is, you got a bad stick, whatever you mm-hmm. tell yourself, to you explore it, look at it, release it. There are ways to release it. Uh, it's different for everyone how it comes. Um, it's tense, but when you actually get to the root of what's bothering you and you can find a way to actually let go of it, it's, it's life-changing. Yeah. It's absolutely life-changing for people. Um, I've changed a lot in the last two years. I hear it from a lot of people, um, especially my wife, who's seen a huge shift in me. Um, yeah. Because trauma came out of me different ways. came out of me with not so much anger, but um, trying to solve everything very fast, quickly, and not dealing with conflict ever. Yeah running from that or finding a solution for it that was always not in my favor Mm -hmm. Um, which was just building more consequences for me and more trauma yeah Um, so yeah the shift for me has been been huge definitely life-changing what is the biggest shift you've seen in yourself over the past two years Um, not trying to control every situation that yeah i don't need to control Control was something I never even realized I thrived on. That was my chaos in life. And it wasn't like control of everything big in life and financial decisions and all that. It was just every situation at hand or trying to make somebody feel better when they were going through trauma because I know I didn't want anyone to expect what I expected yeah so I was always trying to solve that before it would happen so that they didn't have to carry it but I wasn't even doing that I realize that now I was putting a band-aid on a bigger wound I think Mm -hmm. uh, that was always going to surface for people so uh, that's my biggest change is not controlling every situation isn't it exhausting? Like when you really step away from that level of control or attempted control, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and into a place of surrender, into a place of more flow, mm-hmm. you realize just how much energy you were dumping into thinking about and trying to control and, and navigate and step around and all those things. Like all of that control is so energy consuming. I had a lot of energy, and that's why I was able to do as much as I was, but being able to harness that energy and hold it back a little bit, I find that uh, I was exhausting myself, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Pushing my body more than it should have been at uh, all times, um, and not even from my own gratification, just trying to help other people constantly. I gave a lot of myself, and I didn't give it to the right people, and I realized that in a lot of situations. Of course, I always cared for my family. I did the most for them, but I did so much for so many people that that was never rewarding enough for me, Mm -hmm. I would say. Um, So I always looked for something more, I think, uh, to do a little bit more for somebody or uh, try to help the next person. I didn't even know what I was doing, I think. I was just trying to cure trauma in my own life, I think. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how when we don't feel we're enough, how we are constantly trying to do for other people and make them feel like they're enough, and in turn it makes us feel like we are enough. And when you really step away from that pattern and recognize that when we are constantly trying to make everybody else super comfortable and do for them and give to them, um, that... It's really just us that we need to give to yeah. ourselves. Yeah, the second you said that, that mm-hmm. I'd notice the patterns that I change. Um, because you do, you get stuck in certain patterns. We call them trends. We call them different things in life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you get stuck in it and you just repeat it and repeat it. Even if it ain't good for you, you repeat it. Yes. 
You're just like you're on crazy. autopilot, it's right? An absolutely insane thing. And T, you really look at it because none of us want to look at any of the bullshit that we go through. We don't want to look at things that we did wrong. We don't want to admit we have fault. Uh, those are some of the biggest things that people don't look at. When you look at them and you actually can admit you did something wrong and own it with somebody, it's actually pretty relieving to you and say, you know what, I don't have to deal with that again. Well, you may have to deal with it, but you don't have to deal with it as a lie or as a fault that you're carrying that you're telling yourself you don't have a fault. And that's huge. Huge for me. Oh, yes. That weight is so heavy. That weight is so heavy to be holding all the time. And when you can own your bullshit, when you can say like, hey, I didn't act in a way that felt good to me. Like, I didn't show up the way I wanted to show up. I overreacted. I said something I'm not proud of, whatever it is. And you can just own it and apologize. That weight that is lifted off of you is priceless. It is. It makes you change your whole personality and... um Definitely gives you a self-awareness that most people don't even realize. We carry around societal norms, literally. We want to act and be a certain way, and we care about what the, the cool people think about us, and we want to be those cool people, but those cool people we think are cool probably think the same thing about us. We don't even realize it. The stories we tell ourselves and where we find ourselves saying that this person's better than us or I want to be like them. Yeah. Uh, if you can just get to a point where you can be yourself and comfortable with yourself, that's a huge thing. And I'm working on that. Uh, my wife is too. But we still find ourselves falling into the same little cracks that we know we don't want to. And we can now shift out of them very quickly and say, no, that's not me. I don't want to be there. Why did I do that? Uh, but there's always something that that's changing every day yeah it's always going to change um, there's definitely different times of the year where the changes come quicker as yeah. we both know <laughs> yeah um, but for me it's definitely the situations at hand when they're not going the way that I want them to I always tried to steer it in my direction now I'm kind of letting them flow a little bit differently and it's starting to work for me that I don't have to control that stuff or feel like I did something wrong if I didn't help a person that yeah. I felt like I should have um, because I gave too much, did too much. Yeah. And that only comes back to hurt you later on in life, I think, um, because you feel like you're expected even when you're not expected. And yes. And you tell yourself a story that they know you can do that for them. Even if you can't do that, you feel like you, you, you should have done something. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's too much. Other times people don't even want the help. So yeah. you got to be careful, I guess. With anything you do for somebody in this day and age, unless it's wanted by them, you're really not doing them any favors. That's right. Yeah. 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 I love that piece that you were talking about with the societal norms and allowing your authenticity to lead and just be you. And, and how that is really a daily struggle for us, right? And I think that that's all humans. There's a, a kind of pathway that we take into deeper forms of authenticity. It's like different layers to an onion, you know? And you always just keep exploring it, like you said. It, it never goes away, right? Every day there's going to be something new to work on. Um, but when you can really step into more authentic versions of you, when you can make choices that come from a place of authenticity versus what you've been taught or told you should want or you should do, uh, there is so much freedom in that. A lot of freedom in it. Um, it's finding it. That's, that's the hard part for everyone is saying what is expected of me yeah. and what do I actually want to do because we do for others all the time just yeah. thinking that that's what's going to please everybody yeah um, and we find ourselves doing something we don't even want to do for yeah. the sacrifice of somebody else that doesn't mean that you don't say i'm going to this place for dinner with your spouse because you don't like that place yeah you you, get a little <laughs> you compromise yeah there's definitely compromise in life but where societal norms put us at a point where you're supposed to own a house and get married and have a successful job and have money and not struggle and uh, fake it in front of people if you're sad, tell everyone that I'm perfectly fine. That's a tough, tough way to live a life. 
And yeah. I realized that we've done that for years. And you walk by someone at the post office and they say, how you doing? The first thing you say is great. You could be having the shittiest day in the world, but the first thing you say is great. Yeah. Um, you never tell a stranger, geez, I'm having a bad day. Yeah. Because you're afraid no one's going to listen to you or they're going to look at you funny or it's not expected. So it's really weird that we do that to ourselves. But I've, I've realized over the last couple of years that if you're authentic with yourself and if you're having a bad day and you tell someone that, they might stop and listen. Yes. They might just stop and listen or they might have an answer for you that you can't come up with yourself. Yeah. Um, and that's a tough thing to, to do. It really is. Very yeah, tough. that vulnerability piece. Being raw and real and vulnerable is so courageous. Even worse for men. Yes. Because we are supposed to have a very strong yes. demeanor over women, which, again, societal norms put on us, that it's not something that's acceptable to cry over something or show your emotions in yeah. a certain situation. Where I think the world's changing slowly to that, but I don't think that it's changing fast enough for people to get a grip yeah. on it. Um, it's never going to change perfect. There's yeah. always going to be people out there that say, no, this is a man's role and this is a woman's role. But just trying to be happy is what the ultimate goal right. is for all of us. <laughs> to be happy That's right. and live life and not try to do something that you don't want to do, really. Yeah. You know? I mean, if you want to get up in the morning and not take a shower, well, it's okay to do that. I mean, probably not for a week on end. Yeah. But <laughs> you might want to have a... A limit on how many days you go, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're taught to do everything in sequence. Yeah. And that's the way that we raised our kids a little bit. And I feel like, you know, yeah, brushing their teeth was a smart thing and yeah. certain bedtime and study at school, those are those are good societal norms, but other things, you know, um, you can't do this, you can't do that. You, there's so many things in life that I question now. Yes. And Isn't it fun? It's it's fun. Daunting, too. Sometimes. You <laughs> yeah, know, a little overwhelming. Overwhelming to the point where you're like, geez, how far am I going to think this through? Mm -hmm. And now I'm wasting precious time. And I feel that way now in life. Like, I don't want to waste any time doing stupid things anymore. Yeah. I'm going to do dumb things. I'm still going to make bad decisions. It's not, it doesn't change your life to perfectness. It just gives you a new moral compass, I think. Yes. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, to yeah. say, I want to feel comfortable with myself and comfortable around everyone that I find myself around. Yeah, it's like you prioritize things differently. Well, and you do. And, and all of a sudden you get real clear on what the priority is. And it's, you know, making sure that you're happy yeah. and that you're moving through the world the way that you want to and that you're proud of it. And that you're having deep connection with people. I grew up thinking that the people who had the most money had the better lives. And how wrong was I? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter how much wealth you carry. It doesn't matter what car you drive. People like you for who you are. If they don't like you for who you are, you shouldn't even be around them because yeah. they have a different agenda for you. Yeah. Um, and I realized that. But I lived my life a long time thinking money is going to bring you happiness and success. Um, it's going to buy you friends or people are going to want to be around you more because you're successful. Well, that's somewhat true in life for people, but that's a societal sure. norm that sure. I realize that it doesn't matter what you do, if people don't like you, they're going to treat you a certain way or you're going to put people on pedestals or you're going to do things. And it's, I'm 53 and I do question why I have to learn this this late in life is Boy, if I learned this at 23, mm. what a greater life I would have had. Um, so I don't do that to myself. In the beginning, I started doing that. But this is where I'm supposed to learn this. Yes. This yes. is where my journey brought me. Yes. And I'm hoping the next 20, 30 years, whatever I, I live, is going to be peaceful, good, and comfortable enough that I can move on to my next life saying, I've learned all this knowledge in this one. And that's, that's what it's all about. What a beautiful approach. What a beautiful approach. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that it stays that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we do. We all go through challenges. Every day we go through challenges. And it's how we make them the challenge. Whether we want to make it a miserable challenge. Yes. Or let's look at it different. Because we can change the story to everything. Bad things happen all the time. 
But if you can find a little bit of good in it, it's going to be a little bit easier to handle it. That's what I say. That's right. Um, not fun to deal with with problems, deaths with people. Um, it's going to happen. It's part of our life. There's a lot of things that are going to bring us down. Uh, but there's good in everything. And if we can find just a little bit of good in it, it makes it that much easier. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. And that's what I've learned these last couple of years, not to find the bad in everything, find a little bit of good in the bad maybe, and get through that day and tomorrow will be better. That's right. Yeah. It is amazing how we actually get to pick where we put our awareness, whether we're putting our awareness and our focus on the negative aspect of an experience or the positive, right? And I don't even really believe in negative and positive, but that like the, the, the part of the experience that doesn't feel good or maybe there's 5% that does feel good. Do you focus on the 5% or do you focus on the 95%? Like, where is your awareness? Yeah, we put names on everything. We give it a, a, what it is. A, this is bad. Well, yes. Is it really bad or is there any good in it? Exactly right. what you said. Find the good in it. Even if it's the 5%, it's better than the 95 that doesn't feel good. That's right. There's and no doubt about that. That's I agree right. With you 100%. But, you know, every day is different for people. Yeah. Some people live life very happy. And mm -hmm. that's great for them. But there's people with trauma that, like myself, I grew up with a lot of trauma that I didn't even know I had until I opened it up and started looking at it and say, yeah, that was actually pretty shitty. Yeah. This was bad. Um, you need to think about it, release it, get rid of it. Um, and, and it is. It's liberating it really is it's life-changing it feel you feel better by looking at bad things in your life yes and it's kind of weird it's to counterintuitive say right <laughs> totally and but you you find yourself looking at things that you never wanted to look at um but then you look at them a third and a fourth time and they don't feel as bad yes because you're released a little bit of that energy that is holding on to it that makes you feel bad and that's the only way i can explain it Oh, I love it. Yes. You just have to look at it more and more and more. And that's the release, I think, for me. Uh, everyone releases differently. You know, I thought it was going to be this epiphany of I look at this, I think of this, I go through this, I do this, and it's going to be gone, and I'm never going to feel it or think about it again. It may work like that for some people. Not for me. I remember everything that I've gone through, uh, but they don't seem as traumatic to me. Mm, you feel different about them. Completely different. It's like, okay, I felt the feelings that I was holding on to that I never released when that experience happened. Yes. And that's the only way to explain it for me is there's something called somatics, and that's my biggest tool that I use is I go through the whole situation, I look at everything that I can, and I feel it as intently as I can let it come on, whether it's crying, screaming, yelling, Whatever it is that I need to do to feel that emotion that I didn't feel at the time, but you've taught me, um, and then I release it. I feel like it's it's not there anymore. I remember the the situation at hand. I remember what happened. Um, some of it still hurts, so I never release that. But the stuff that I have released, I know I have released. So yeah, it's different. Different for everyone, though. It is different for everybody. And, and that's the thing that um, you just find what works for you, right? Somatics for you was pretty life changing. It was, it was a game changer. It was a game changer for you. I remember watching it happen in real time as you were taking a couple different somatic classes. Yeah. And I watched it click for you and I watched you shift. And it was like things that would keep looping around and keep coming back again. You were able to get under them and be with them in a very different way using somatics yeah. and have an actual release where they didn't keep looping. The looping was my problem. It was like yeah. There wasn't releasing. I was looking at it. I didn't know how to feel it. That was my biggest issue is knowing how to use my mind was what works. Yes. My <laughs> mind, my mind, my mind. No problem with that. <laughs> Can't release with the mind. I realize that. The mind is going to tell me different stories and trick me into thinking that I released it, but it releases through my body. That's how I feel it. Yes. So um, that's my biggest, my biggest releases in my body. And learning my body telling me things was something that was huge for me because I never listened to it. Didn't even know that I could listen to it. Once I learned that and I could feel it through my body, I knew I was releasing at that point. 
But again, everyone's going to do it different. You know, we have different channels to use, different ways to run about it. And when you find it, you hold on to that, and that that's your that's your out. Yeah. We all learn differently too. Yes. Um, I didn't go to school for a very long time, so my education level is not super high. I'm super street smart, but. I learned differently than everybody, uh, but I just see things and I can do it. I don't have to read something to understand it completely. Um, but once you feel it or you do it once, I'll never forget it. You own in that knowledge. You own the knowledge. Yeah. It's different. And isn't that so beautiful that we all learn differently? We all heal differently. And there's so many different modalities and different ways at getting underneath our trauma and into a healing space. And you just need to figure out what works for you in that moment, knowing that it could change. Yeah. And me and my wife are completely different when it comes to yes. the, <laughs> the healing process for us. She think, does things differently. I mean, I've tried her techniques and different things. Um, but if it doesn't work, you don't do it. I mean, yeah. If it doesn't feel right to you, you can't force something to work for you. No. As soon as you get it, you run with it. And we both agreed that, you know, we're going to learn differently. We like doing it together, but uh, we're able to share things that are um, way more open. And that's where the healing begins. There's no doubt about that. That for a couple or a single person, it's finding what works for you and moving in somatics. That's definitely mine. I couldn't teach it to anyone though. That's not something I could do. I could tell them about it and I could explain what I've done and I hope they get something out of it. But mm-hmm. I could I couldn't teach it to somebody. That's the weird part about it is say this is what I did exactly to get here. I just know that it happens. Mm-hmm. So that's, mm-hmm. just, that's a little bit crazy to me still, so I still can't wrap my head around that. Because mm-hmm. if you had two plus two, it's four. Simple now. Uh, with spirituality, I don't think there's a simple math to it for anybody. Um, yeah. Some of it will be, but not all of it. No. If you could summarize in one sentence what somatics did for you, what would that be? Um, opening a channel for release for me that I was unable to access before. And I thought it was, but the second I got the somatics, and if somebody understands the somatics and understands, as you explain it through, like what a zebra would do, through the channels that they would run through, through fight, flight, freeze, and that's a whole other story, um, you know exactly what they are. And you know how to access it, and that was my life changer for me, is saying, okay, this is what your body's doing, this is what your body's saying, this is where you're at with this. That's what it works for me. Yeah. Isn't it so fun to get to realize that your body is talking to you all day, every day? Yeah. And it's like you just have to learn the language that your body speaks. Yeah. And most people think, oh, geez, I broke my arm. Well, that's your body speaking to you. Yeah. You get yeah. cut. Okay, <laughs> that's your body speaking to you. Uh, but your body speaks to you spiritually, too. There's no oh, yeah. doubt about it. Uh, yeah, you know, we shake when we're cold because your body's telling you, you need to warm up. It's your mm-hmm. body talking to you. You don't just shiver because you're cold. It's your body talking. Uh, And once you realize how your body talks to you, that's a game changer. Yeah. Totally. Because you can listen in a completely different way. And it really really helps to guide decisions. It makes decisions so easy because your body is telling you what it wants and needs. Yeah. And the same thing with spirit. You know, people are going to pick up on that too. We all have different guides and how we interpret those and what we see or how we get them but with somatics it's my body not controlling my mind likes to control everything and we're always in mind (laughs) we are getting out of mind is difficult for me up till probably two years ago i'd say maybe a year and a half ago and once i clicked that was a game changer for me so good yeah it it's I encourage everyone to try it. Not everyone's going to like it or understand it at first, but if they, it's like anything else. Keep trying it. Because uh, I got discouraged in the beginning. I'm like, well, where is this epiphany that's supposed to happen? You know, <laughs> It's not. It's gradual. But when it happens, you know. And then you get to stick with that same route. If it works, it works. You know, yeah. uh, Some people have to take two aspirin. Other people take four for a headache. It's that simple. Yeah. You know? To, to me, it is now, but I didn't understand that before. Yeah. You know, 
Uh, but there's a lot of different ways to heal in spirituality, and I've learned that too. Uh, somatics isn't going to be the game changer for everybody, but there's one out there that they'll find, and you definitely have a lot of tools to use. So, uh, sound baths are pretty good for me too. Yes. Um, don't understand them completely, but I definitely see things or feel things through that that um, open up different doors for me, I'd say, or things that I've never remembered or didn't want to remember. And that's the weird part about not wanting to remember something. Uh, I didn't even think my mind could do that. But the last couple of years, I've started going back in my past to look at things and you wouldn't believe the stuff that you block out that you don't want to remember. And those are the traumas that probably weigh you down more in life than anyone could even imagine. Um, you know, I, I didn't think that it was wrong that I went to a YDC, as we've talked about, um, until I really looked at it and seen the decisions that were made and how they were made and looked at what trauma that actually created for me and released that. Um, I didn't want to look at it. I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. It was just the way that it was. You know, it wasn't the way that it was. It was very traumatic for a child to be separated from their mother for insignificant reasons and put into a jail. Um, but society allows that to happen to a lot of people. They don't realize the trauma that it takes place. Yeah. 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 yeah that, was, that, was, that was big. Of course, my father dying at five that was huge trauma for me too. Um, separation anxiety at its ultimate peak for me was um, throughout my life. I mean, I just got a handle on that now. Um, I think that that's something that one of my biggest struggles is um, always worried about losing something that you have because when it's taken away from you at an early age, we don't even know how to deal with it. Uh, so I swallowed that now for years and now I look at that and I'm still working on that um, it will it will surface something huge for me one day and I'll be like wow that's it that was the one um, it doesn't hurt as much to look at those now and I don't worry about that as much as I used to um, so that's, that's a big one for me it's a huge one yeah, it is a, big a huge one, one. Yeah. for anybody who's lost a loved one the way that you did you know at such a young age yeah. and without Warning, you Without know, warning. just one day. Yeah, because it was, it was, he was going to the hospital for a routine operation, <laughs> so to speak. Of course, as a child, they don't tell you the risks involved. Yeah. Um, nor probably did they even consider the risks that back in, yeah, that could happen. But yeah, it was, it was definitely uh, uh, something that I had to deal with. And I, again, I'm still dealing with it to an extent. Um, I hope to be like free of it one day forever, but I don't see that yet, but um, I know it's coming. I just don't know when. Yeah. And I don't put time expectations on anything anymore. It's another huge one for me. Yeah. Is I would be like, all right, I'm going to give it this much time, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, that's a wrong one. The universe is laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hold on to this one for me. I'll come get it in a couple of years. That's right. <laughs> check back. Yeah, check back with me. <laughs> on my time frame, not yours. <laughs> yeah, the universe is, is funny. You know? and, um, like I said, my wife searched and searched and searched, and she went down so many different books and read different things and different scenarios. And I think what really set me into motion with all of it was her reading a book about how the universe really controls everything. And uh, it's the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. exactly what it was. That was definitely the first thing that made me go, aha, there's something else out there other than just our existence. Yeah. Because that's all we really look at until things are thrown in front of us to challenge our awareness of what's out there. Because it's a big universe. Yes. It's a big universe around us. And yes. It's got to lead somewhere. <laughs> That's right. That's what I say now. So. I love that. Yeah. What do you think the role was of trauma in your addiction? So that was definitely masking the situation at hand. 
Um, I definitely, when I started drinking, if we were real busy, we owned a business, and it would become very stressful. Uh, it started with, I'll have a couple drinks that'll shut my mind down, because my mind controls everything. And I'll be able to go to sleep earlier and get a better night's rest. Well, that led to one more, more drinks, and it was just masking the problem at hand. Never cured the problem. Yeah. Um, I'd wake up to the next the problem the next day, which just built and built and built and built and built, which says, let's drink more, let's have more, let's have more. So eventually, my addiction was at a certain height where I was just trying to hide everything that I didn't want to look at. And if I started looking at it, that's when the abuse would start. So it almost became daily um, throughout the day. You know, if you got five or six hours through a day sober, um, that was a good day. But as the stuff started piling up, I would I would use alcohol. Uh, and then I was introduced to prescription drugs for different pains that I had, and that's only temporary because that escalates even better than alcohol. Your tolerance to that just skyrockets, and you can't live without that. You will change your entire life for that substance, and whatever it is, that becomes the ultimate goal. So addiction's very tough on people because uh, you give up everything for one thing. And that's no doubt. Uh, your whole life controlled by either alcohol or drugs or both. Um, people say there's working alcoholics. No, they're alcoholics. They can just function at work. It's that's how I was. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a tough run. It was about ten years for me. Mm. Uh, I would say my worst was probably thirty eight, but I was really sick at that point. I couldn't. My bile ducts had shut down, which uh, leave all the toxins in your body. And I didn't dare tell anybody that I was using drugs or alcohol, never mind my wife, who would be horrified. You know, was, she knew I drank, but she didn't know there was any drugs involved. But it would have killed me if I didn't tell her. And I was probably on my deathbed a couple times. She said, you know, I don't see what she's seen. And that was very traumatic for her, too. So she's doing a lot of healing around that. Um, but that, that was tough. And it's tough to hear that that happened because uh, I put someone through that. So alcoholism and drug abuse for me didn't just affect me. It had a ripple effect to everyone around me, uh, especially my wife and my children, who hopefully my children seen and learned a good lesson from it. If it got anything... It's not to abuse drugs or alcohol. Um, and I never wish that on them, of course. Yeah. I think we sidetracked a little bit on the question, though. <laughs> I love your answer. Yeah. I don't think it was a sidetrack at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If you could give one piece of advice to somebody who is struggling with addiction, what would it be? Reach out and get the help. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. People are willing to help you. Uh, it might be a stranger, it might be uh, the person you least expect in your life, uh, but there's always someone willing to help you. Don't be afraid to do it because you can't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say you can do it on your own, but that's probably the 1.1.1.1%. You need help. People yeah. need help. There's all kinds of help, whether it's spiritual, whether it's... Western medicine, which is probably where it's going to start. Um, and then you need to find something that's going to keep you happy, I'd say. Uh, after coming out of sobriety, when I got sober, it was knowing what I did to everybody around me. And you feel really guilty. Mm -hmm. um, that's not enough to keep someone sober. you got to be at that point that you want it. Um, but I ask people because there's so many people that will help uh, there's so much help out there and it's easier than a lot of people think it's not yeah it's shitty it's not fun uh, but it's a lot better than the alternative because you will die from it it doesn't matter I mean it may not be a quick death but it will kill you alcohol drugs eventually will kill you I'm not talking about recreational marijuana or um 
things that aren't addictive either. Because there are things out there that people can use for anxiety or um, plant medicine, basically. Uh, but what we consider legal alcohol should be illegal um, because most people will get addicted to it. I would say 60% of the people who start drinking will be an alcoholic at some point in their life. And I may be wrong on the statistics, it may be higher, but... Um, but it's a big number. It's a big number. Yeah. It, it's a big number. When the alcohol companies have to pay for a portion of rehabilitation out of their profits, and the government doesn't talk about it on a regular basis, it's a problem. It's a problem. Yeah, and I think that so many of us have trauma from, from childhood. I think if you lived through childhood, you've got trauma. Yeah. If you made it out of childhood. You're carrying trauma. And those emotions can be so hard to navigate if you don't have the tools or skills or support. And so, you know... Support's when the big word. Support, yeah. Nobody gets that or feels that they can give it without being vulnerable or judged. Yes. That's huge. And I didn't mean to cut you off. I just I had no. to say that. No, I love it. It's so true. It's so true. Uh, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough world out there for people. And... Alcohol is a quick way for people to take a bad time into a, a good time. Yeah, to stop feeling those feelings. Stop feeling the feelings. Swallow them down. Sometimes you can swallow them down and not think about them the next day, but they're going to surface. <laughs> yes. They will surface. You're probably at the wrong time. Oh, that just leads to more alcohol. But yeah. you know, uh, if you're drinking and you're hearing this, if you're doing drugs and you're hearing this, and you don't want to do it anymore, there's so much help out there so much help and people are willing to help you uh, they're not out there that's not fake you know uh, A's for some people uh, detoxes for other people I mean there's so many so many different avenues for people to take uh, just picking one and trying it and it may not work for you just like spirituality for some people exactly uh, different avenues um, but if you want the help it's out there and you can get sober and I'm living proof of it I've been sober for well over 12 years and I'm not perfect, but I'm sober. It's amazing. Yeah. You should be so proud of yourself. Well, I am. I'm proud of the people that supported me, too, though. That comes a long way because uh, without the support, it's very difficult to do it because you're judged. And people shouldn't <laughs> judge people for it. They should tell them differently, not, geez, you shouldn't have got there in the first place. That's not what you want to hear while you're trying it's to It's not talk. helpful. No one has to tell me I broke my arm. My arm's broken. I know it's broken. The same thing with being an alcoholic. You know, you can just support them and say it's a good thing that you're doing it, um, and we support you if there's something we can do. But mean it when you say that. Don't don't give people false hope either, because that's not good. Uh, but the help's out there. It's simple. It's plain and simple. If yeah. you want to get sober, anyone can do it. It's just a choice on that part. Uh, it's a tough road, though. It's not going to happen overnight. There's no quick fix to it. It's, it's time, just like anything else. Yeah. But if you set your mind to anything in this world, we could do it. And that, it's proof. It's proven. Um, you know, our mind's very powerful. Yes. And it will trick you constantly. It will <laughs> tell you why you don't want to become sober, because you're going to disappoint people, or you're not going to be able to do this, or you're going to be shut down for three weeks, or whatever your mind tells you, it will try to override that alcoholism. But if you want the help, just ask, and there's people that will guide you. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for sharing your story, and yeah, my um, I think that there are a lot of people that will really benefit from hearing about your your path and your journey and maybe there's something there for them and i hope so i hope that you know somebody can find something that resonates for them and don't be afraid to reach out to erin if you see this you know um, she can definitely guide you in spirituality that most people can't so you know but i thank you for everything you've done thank you yeah it is always um such a blessing to me to get to be in vulnerable places with people you know, when somebody sits down and, and talks to me about the trauma from their childhood, and maybe they've only told one person, maybe they haven't told anybody, maybe they've told five people, but when they are sharing 
those vulnerable, raw, real places inside of them, it is not lost on me what a gift that is to get to be with people in those spaces. And it's, they're lucky to have you because you're authentic with it. You actually help them, guide them through them. A lot of people don't even understand what's happening or why they're feeling that. And you have a gift for that. So it's, it is, uh, it, it's mutual for everyone, I think, when you say that. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. I so yeah. appreciate that. We have loved having you here with us, Ron. Um, and whether you guys are watching this in the morning, day, evening, or night, I hope you guys have a beautiful day, morning, evening, and night. And we appreciate you being here with us at Rose Quartz Mediumship Podcast.